السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحابه أجمعين الله سبحانه وتعالى says in سورة البقرة آية number twenty one and twenty two the one we are inshallah going to focus again this beautiful morning of this blessed month. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our hearts to his book. Ya ayyuhanna sobudu rabbakum allazi khalakakum allazina min qablikum la'allakum tattakun. Allazi jala lakum al-arda firashum wa samaa binaam wa anzala min as-samaa imaan fakhraja bihi min al-thamarati rizqal lakum. فَلَا تَجْعَلُ لِلَّهِ يَنْدَادًا وَأَنْتُمْ تَعْلَمُونَ O people, worship your Rabb who created you and who created those before you. لَعَلَّكُمْ تَتَّكُونَ لَعَلَّكُمْ لَعَلَّا is almost impossible to translate because it has many aspects but for now let's just say so that the takun so that you gain taqwa again taqwa is not translatable allazi jala lakum al ard firashan was samaa binaam wa anzala min as samaa maa'an fa akhraja bihi min al thamarati rizqan lakum the one who made the earth firasham is like a firash is like a bed a spread out place and he made the sama binam he made the sama a bina again we we'll, inshallah go into the details of this word and he sent down from the sky, from the sma water, and through it he produced min samarat. Min is also something that we are going to reflect on. <clears throat> it says min samarat. Samarat is fruit, but from some of the fruits. Is kallakum as provisions for you. Falata jalu lillahi andad. So do not make andad with Allah. Andad from nid is equals. Wa antum ta'alamun. And you know. The question that we had asked last time and started to say something about it is when. The 21 year old comes and says, Mom, why should I worship? Why should I fast? What to do? And uh, this is just obviously a rhetorical question what to do? <clears throat> but it's a real life situation. Many parents have this situation where at a certain point in their lives, a son or a daughter says, Why should I worship? Why should I fast? Why should I pray? And uh, the first thing that uh, this question should bring out is to say Alhamdulillah. Because this question actually indicates that the, the son or the daughter has woken up the son or the daughter who is asking this question, and I'm assuming this is a serious question. It's not just uh, out of laziness of not or other reason, but it's a very serious question that the son and the daughter now has come to gather enough courage to say to the parent, why should I be worshipping? Which means that the received faith, the person, the son or the daughter who grew up in a Muslim home has now actually come to question the received 
faith and this is a really a, a place of shukr because uh, even like according to many uh, many of our scholars the belief of a muqallid the mindless thoughtless belief is not really belief meaning that uh, when we say ashhadu la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadar rasulullah these are two shahadat shahadatain these are the two statements of knowledge and if if the knowledge is not there and we are just automatically assuming this to be the case that we are muslims then that faith is not valid in the sense of having been actualized known with dalil and uh, this is the uniqueness of our of our religion religion that uh, allah subhanahu wa taala has made it possible for us to testify and verify why we believe what we believe the quran is just full of these and some of these inshallah we are going to go into details uh, of the dalail but one thing before we go into that is that these are not really the arguments and the proofs for the existence of allah subhanahu wa taala there is no uh, there is no need for the and there is no no possibility of proving the existence of a creator through arguments through dalail through proofs although there are lots of proofs but all of them can be can have counter proofs as we said last time he says well you say he created me or the saya says he created me and he created all those people before me but my teacher says or i know from my what i've learned of science that everything just evolved so this evolution nullifies this claim that i should worship because i have been created um, by allah subhanahu wa taala and even if uh, even if uh, those parents who want to say well okay you, you can say that evolution is the cause but who is the cause of evolution he obviously you can keep going back uh, and eventually you will reach a place where you cannot go further back any in this case the big bang the person is going to argue that big bang resulted in the creation of the initial creation of uh, of the prime prime matter which eventually cooled off and became a living cell and it multiplied but if you say well who created the big bang the person is not going to be able to answer that because nobody really knows who created the big bang and why big bang came into existence at a certain time and why even with using their own time frame instead of uh, when they say it happened why did it happen at that time and not before or after those questions are not really provable uh, through any kind of empirical scientific observation and data that means eventually we are standing at a place where there is no possibility of a rational discourse on the existence of the creator or the lack thereof so we know that belief is uh, is a light in the heart eventually and uh, therefore this uh, proverb about the faith of the old woman some say old woman of nishapur uh, but any old woman who has no need to prove the existence of allah subhanahu wa taala uh, to worship that is the best state but that does not mean we are advocating blind faith on the contrary and the quran is inviting us over and over to have a verified belief verified belief produces yakeen it produces certitude it produces a foundation for us to stand on because when the winds winds start to blow 
when these children go to university, when they are exposed to all kinds of uh, uh, new ideas and they don't have the foundation, it's likely that they will slip because they're not really standing on anything but what you told them. Just be Muslim. Um, that used to work. People didn't even have to tell them, but not in our time. Therefore, it's very important for us to, well, obviously not every parent is going to be able to argue with the 21 year old who has gone to university and uh, taken some courses and become very sharp in uh, argumentation and all of that. It's not possible for, um, for the mother or the father to produce the same kind of sophisticated argument that the professor has produced. And of course, the authority of the professor is more than the authority of a mother or father in, in, even. So what, what is to be done? As I said, the beginning is Alhamdulillah, that you have woken up and now you are asking, you are using your own inner resources to ask questions which are fundamental to your life and to your death and to what happens to you hereafter, in the hereafter. So this awakening, this awakening is really a place of shukr. Uh, it should be a place of shukr rather than a place of panic. Second, <clears throat> uh, Obviously, if the person, if the parent is able to produce enough clarity you know, in the heart and mind of a child, uh, that's good. But if not, if the resources are not there, intellectual resources are not there, and uh, one's own faith is uh, also not really through investigation, it is received faith. One is a Muslim because born in a Muslim family. And then the best thing would be to have the son or the daughter open up to someone who can actually talk to the person, talk to the son or the daughter in, in the language that they understand. In both cases, uh, one of the things that we should not neglect is, of course, the polishing of the heart, because no matter what the mind is saying, no matter where this whole case is going to finally come, uh, there is something in the dua of a mother or a father for the son or the daughter, and there is no substitute for that. And what, what transformation happens to the hearts is also through the dua. There is no substitute for that. So having said that, uh, I, don't, I don't wish to go into the details of the arguments that, uh, because even if you know some of these arguments, the son or the daughter is going to be able to tear them apart because these arguments are uh, to be uh, to be based on a certain kind of knowledge uh, that uh, uh, that one gains uh, through formal training and understanding of uh, in in several several branches of knowledge, including logic, including. Uh, Tafsir studies, um, linguistics, and many other branches of knowledge. So we are not here to enter enter those. What I do want to do, however, is to go through some of the discussions in Tafsir Kabir of uh, of Pakhruddin uh, Razi, uh, he's, uh, he's one of the greatest Mufassirs when it comes to rational discourse on the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
and uh, his uh, 33 volume tafsir is really a gold mine it's really a gold mine for us to to dig into in case we need this kind of uh, rationalization which is not really bad in case of uh, adults who have the need, who have a real question, but it's not really for playing around. It's not really uh, just for passing time because these are very serious issues. So if the son and the daughter, if they are really serious, one would really ask them to go and study something like uh, Tafsir Kabir with someone. And they obviously cannot study on their own. So they have to find a teacher. <laughs> However, because we are interested in a general understanding of uh, the framework of our belief system. Why do we believe what we believe? Obviously, the first thing is we believe because we have said ashhadu la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna muhammadar rasulullah and these two statements of knowledge mean that we are confirming that there is none worthy of worship except allah and that muhammad alayhi salatu wassalam is his messenger and both of them have told us to worship allah subhanahu wa ta'ala But just to deepen our understanding of the ayah and the beauty of, of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to really uh, have some degree of uh, solidity in, in our understanding of our deen, uh, Razi says that uh, he's got a lot of uh, pages devoted to every single aspect of this ayah because uh, normally... When our mufassirs, they come to the ayah where something is mentioned, they spend time, energy, effort to explain it when they first come to that word, the term, or a combination thereof. So because this is the ayah, these two ayahs are the first time in the sequential arrangement of the Qur'an, that we have the mention of the of the earth, the mention of the sama, the mention of uh, uh, this command to worship. So there is a lot of uh, explanation just on this ayah, several pages. I didn't count the number of pages, but these are several pages. I think at least at least. Uh, 20 or 25 pages uh, on this one ayah. The first thing he says that uh, obviously he always begins Fafihi Masail and I think I mentioned some time ago that when he says Masail he means aspect of aspects of the ayah, issues related to the ayah, debates, questions, uh, explanations of that ayah. So uh, in it, there are masail. And masail here are questions which arise in a thinking mind related to the ayah. Rabbakum ullazi khalaqakum ullazina min kablikum. Allah SWT has commanded his ibad to worship him and he gave the argument for that command from their creation. So, Elam Annahu Subhanahu Lamma Amara Ibi Ibada Ibada Tirabihi Ardafahu Bimaya Dullu Allah Vajudi Sani, Wahua Halkul Mukalifin, Mukalafin, Mahalkum Min Man Kablahum, Wahaza Yadullu Allah Annahu La Tarika Ila Marfati Lahitala. Illa bin Nazari wal istadlali ata'ana kawmun min al hashbiyati Pihazi tariqa. So he says that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
know that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded his ibad, his slaves to worship, he gave them the proof and the argument from the wajood sani wa huwa khalqul mukallafin he gave them the proof of this command from the existence of a creator who created the mukallafin and he created those who came before them now this mukallaf this we need to really internalize and understand that uh, we are all accountable. This taklif is a built-in human condition. And although I know people are there who would say, well, no, this is all we have. We die and we are done. And this is what the kuffar did before. So this is not a new thing to deny the resurrection and the accountability. However, that denial does not nullify the reality of the resurrection and the reality of Kiyama and the reality of afterlife. And the entirety of the Quran is actually geared towards convincing human beings to wake up and say, yes, don't, don't deny because the denial of something which is al haqa which is the reality, al haqa mal haqa wa ma adraka mal haqa, which is, I mean, this event, idha wa qatil waqiya, this event is so real that to deny it is just self-destruction of the greatest kind. Because on that day, uh, there will be no possibility of returning. And uh, another aspect of this is that no one is going to be able to deny that they are going to die. Everyone knows that everybody who comes to this world dies, is gone, so when they are gone, when they die, if they are denying that there is anything after that, then what is the foundation of their existence? Like what meaning is left in life if there is no hereafter? What meaning is left in any understanding of anything if there is no accountability and there is no resurrection, because the one who is killing these children in Gaza, uh, what argument do we have? If life of this world is the end of everything, well, I just did this because I just did it, and I'm not accountable, nothing is going to happen to me, then where is justice? So built, built into the human, human being is the sense of justice, is the sense of beauty is the sense is the need for understanding why there is so much evil in this world and if the one who is doing all these things is the same as someone who is not doing then these then there is no meaning left in anything those who create their own meaning they say well i have 60 70 years whatever time i have and my meanings in this existence come from what I do within this time period. I don't care. I don't know what's going to happen to me after this. The entirety of their building, everything collapses when the first heart attack happens. Everything collapses when a calamity hits. Everything collapses when they are struck by something that shatters their their worldly life, whether it's financial or emotional or psychological, when the wife dies, when the child dies, when accident happens, when something happens, people are really left with no foundation because there was no concept of the hereafter. So there are existential needs for human beings to have something in their life that provides meanings 
for what happens in this life. So the idea that uh, life is just what we construct is, is batil is not really uh, valid because if everything were to come uh, from within ourselves, then there is no meaning left. One can, one can create certain ethics. People do that. They just say, well, I just love good, so I'm... I'm giving my millions in charity because I just love to be good. Yes, those things are possible, but these, again, these self-constructed ideas of ethics, without the foundation, which is the hereafter, without the foundation, which is the accountability, without the acceptance of the human condition, which is, which is the cliff, which is accountability, which is... Uh, which is a relationship with the Creator. Without that, everything becomes zero. Imam Jafar Sadiq, a man came to him and he said, I don't, I don't believe there is any Creator. So this, uh, any, it's just a proportion. Now we have a huge proportion percentage of human beings who can openly, dearly claim that uh, there is no creator, and they become very famous, right? This uh, Richard Dawkins, and people like him, uh, because they, uh, they have a stage, they come on the stage, they talk, and then they go. But even before, there were people, not in these numbers, but there were people. So he came to Imam Jafar and he said, I don't, I don't believe in the Creator. So Imam Jafar said that, have you ever traveled? He said, yes. Have you ever traveled on a ship? He said, yes. He said, when you were traveling on a ship, was there any time when a storm came? He said, yes. One day, wind just came and it just broke the the ship and uh, all the sailors, people who were in charge of the ship, they all drowned. But I was so lucky. I just had this plank, which I just held in my hand. So I was just saved with this by this plank. But then uh, what happened was that uh, these waves just threw me uh, deeper into the ocean, and uh, the plank just slipped from my hand. And uh, when the plank was gone, another wave came immediately and it threw me out onto the, onto the shore. So Imam Jafar said, well, first you had a faith on the, on the ship or the boat or the sailing boat. Then you had, you had the, the sailors were your... Uh, you had confidence in, in them. When they were gone, then you relied on the plank and that it will take you, it will uh, save you. And when all of that was gone, even the plank went out of your hand, did you then give up on having life and said, okay, I'm done, I'm finished, or did you still have hope? And he said, no, no, I had hope. He said, Mimman kunta uh, You had hope from what? what? What did you hope for? So he became quiet. And uh, Imam Jafar said, that was your creator. Believe it or not, you had hope in, the cre in your Creator, even at that time in the depth of the ocean, that He would save you. And He did save you. So He became a Muslim.
there are many examples that uh, Razi gives um, experiential experiential examples and these are deeply buried in our sources um, you know the famous uh, case of uh, the Prophet ﷺ resting under the shade of a tree and this kafir comes and uh, he says ah look at that so the sword is sitting next to him he's fast asleep so he picks up the sword and uh, the Prophet ﷺ wakes up and the kafir says, ha, who is going to save you now? You are alone. I have your sword. And the Prophet ﷺ told him very calmly, my Allah is going to save you. And the kafir, he just trembled and the sword fell from his hand. And the Prophet ﷺ picked up the sword and said, who is going to save you now? And he said, Allah. <laughs> so the Prophet ﷺ, uh, Mama Abu Hanifa there were people who were really these terrorists at that time as well so they would actually pick the scholars and they knew that if we kill these scholars our ideology what we believe would gain and so they won't be able to to refute and uh, so any a group of them came and they they surrounded Imam Abu Hanifa one day and uh, they said, we are going to kill you. And uh, he said, okay, if you want to kill me, do so. But before you do that, please answer one question. After that, you can do what you came to do. And they said, okay, what do you want us to answer? He said, what do you say? about a person who says that I saw a boat full of people, full of uh, mal, full of material. And it was uh, in the ocean and there were huge waves and uh, winds were blowing against it. <clears throat> but even then it was just going on the right path where it wanted to go. Although there were no sailors, there was there were no guards. No one was really uh, moving it. Uh, would you would you accept that? So no. Who would accept that? And uh, Imam Abu Hanifa then said, "Is alam ya juz fil akli safina tu tajri fil bahri mustawiya." من غير متعاهد ولا مجري فكيف يجوز قيام هذه الدنيا؟ He said that if your aql, if you don't accept that a boat can be on the ocean without a sailor still going in the right direction where it needs to go, how could you accept? the existence of the dunya, the existence of this whole world. Which obviously has all of this, di this diversity of states. Without, without uh, a creator and without a protector. So all of these atheists, uh, they started to weep and then they accepted. And the famous uh, example from Imam Shafi that they gave is, uh, 
he was asked, so what is your dalil, what is your proof for the existence of a creator? And he said, the leaf of the mulberry. And he asked them in return, that tamuha uh, walaunuha warihuha watabuha wahidun indakum do you think that it's uh, it has these characteristics of uh, of a color of a taste of a, of a fragrance all of this this leaf of the of the mulberry tree it just has a specific kind of and they said yes obviously it's got these properties. Then he said that when the silkworm eats it, it makes silk. When the honeybee eats it, it makes honey. When a goat eats it, it may, it it just uses it, and what comes out of it, it comes out of it. When the when the deer eats it. Uh, it produces musk. So how can all of these diverse things appear from something that has just one specific characteristic? So there are many Many sayings, these are beautiful wisdom sayings. Guru Muhammad also has this beautiful example of a, of a fortress, which is totally enclosed. It's made of pure gold and silver, but there is no, no hole in it. It's totally en enclosed. And then he says that, uh, can you believe that suddenly one of the, uh, one of the walls of this fort uh, splits and a living being comes out able to listen, see, walk. And if that happens, would you say that there must be a, a file? There must be someone who did it? <laughs> so the example is that of, uh, of an egg and uh, also of a child. So when the 21-year-old comes, and says, why should I worship? The first Dalil that uh, Razi, may Allah, increase him in his uh, stations in the hereafter, uh, he provides us is that uh, uh, it is from your own self. He says that uh, when you were in the womb of the mother, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had set a time for your birth. And when the time came and he said, now you're going to be born, you did not resist your birth. And for nine months, you were already in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your whole being was in a state of worship and you didn't commit any sin whatsoever. And you remained obedient to his will. And when he willed, you came out. And when you came out, you had no means of sustaining yourself. You were totally helpless. Uh, so if now you are asking this question, about why should I worship, you are actually denying what you didn't deny 
at the time of your birth. And uh, so the dalil that he says Allah SWT gives is that uh, your birth, your very existence is dependent on me because Allah SWT is the one who granted you existence. And not only you, but also those who came before you. And he said this because if you if you came into existence, you came into existence because of your parents, and your parents came into existence because of their parents and their parents, their parents, all the way to the first human beings. And if he is the Khalik, if he is the creator of, of all of them, because without their existence, your existence is impossible. Therefore, you are in a state of a relationship with the creator, whether you accept it or not. Now, if you say that, why should I worship? Why should I fast? If that question is a real question and you want to understand, you understand it from the dalil, from the proof of your own existence, because the, the, the foundation of your existence, your own life is dependent on the creator. And the creator is saying, he did not create the jinn and the ins except to worship him. Unless one of them says that actually, that he created uh, now, you see the, the, the structure of this ayah, it is exclusive. It means like the wama, not created. I did not create the jinn and the ins except the Yabudun, except to worship me. Right? So this, this ayah of Surah Zariyat has a very exceptional any in, in terms of logic, it has an exception that the creation was for nothing but Illa, to worship Liyabudun so that they worship me. Now, because we have already established that this 21 year old's existence depends on the Creator, therefore, the Creator is saying. Worship me. Therefore, there is no um, any. There, there is there is no reason to not accept that, as far as the logic is concerned. Because you wouldn't be here. You wouldn't even be asking these questions. They're very beautiful, beautiful. Uh, sayings. Uh, a Bedouin uh, was asked, so what is your dalil for the existence of the Creator? And he said that uh, the, the, the camel's droppings are a proof alibrata tadallu ala al-bair the, the droppings from a camel are a proof for the camel. The, 
the footprints of a donkey are a proof for the existence of the donkey. So, so this the sky with all its planets and the earth with all its wide paths and the ocean with its waves are they not proof enough for an all-knowing, all-powerful, and all-merciful creator. Well, as he says that, uh, like a tabib, a medical doctor was asked, so what is your, how did you recognize your rub? And he said that uh, this uh, nose runs when I have cold, and uh, uh, it's very thick. Whereas uh, my saliva, which is very thin, <laughs> doesn't run from my, from my mouth. Someone else said that uh, I recognize my rub from the honeybee, from the... Uh, and from the, from the honeybee, which has uh, honey and poison at the same time, like when it bites. Ultimately, Allah SWT says, La wala in saltahum man khalakahum la yakulun Allah. If you ask them who created them, they would say Allah. There is a set of ayahs, la yakulun Allah. They, they would say Allah. They would say Allah. So this... Uh, Shalab takes us to the question of the next aspect of this question, which is if the if it is accepted by the 21-year-old that uh, his existence or her existence depends on the creator, and then the second aspect is of Mithak, that uh, all humanity, including this 21-year-old, has a covenant with the creator that was taken out, alas to be rabbikum, am I not your Lord? And we all said, bala shahidna, indeed we, uh, you are, and we bear witness to that. And obviously the, the, the deal would be, well, I don't remember that, sorry, mom. You are just saying this, but I, I don't. Uh, so the answer to that is that uh, if you have accepted that there is a creator, your own existence depends on the creator. The creator tells us that he has sent a messenger and he has sent messengers before him and those messengers have told us to worship. And then the answer, the question then would be, well, how do I know uh, what, what you are saying is true? The answer is that the entire case of the veracity of the revelation rests on the veracity of the messenger. And therefore, one of the most fundamental aspects of the life of the Prophet ﷺ, which has been preserved for us, is this incident of uh, Abu Sufyan uh, before he accepted Islam, traveling to what is Rome, what was Rome, to Heracles. And uh, he asked him the question about the veracity, honesty, truthfulness. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ was known to be a Sadiq, al Sadiq al Amin, even before he received the first Wahi. So people knew him as someone who was truthful. So the argument that you cannot argue with me from the basis of the Quran because I don't know if, if you know if if that is the argument if the argument goes to that extent that I don't really believe 
that the Quran is really true. Uh, then we have the we have the argument for the sake of argument that uh, something established through tawatur through continuous unbroken chain of reports cannot be denied only a mad person would deny that like if if we can establish something through continuous chain of reporters, reports from one to the next person. Um, and in, that's a proof. And we have a proof that uh, there was a human being in Mecca who was known as Alameen, a Sadiq Alameen, who was trustworthy, who was truthful. We have continuous reports about that. And he is the one who said that Wahi has started to come to him. So if somebody did not lie all his life, for 40 years he lived among them and they knew him. This was one of the characteristics of his being, alayhi salatu wasalam. So, I mean, there are many, many other ways, but ultimately it's the heart. And if the heart has been tarnished by what it received through the nafs and through the professors and through the readings and through some unknown sources also because psychological forces are unknown. Um, one cannot really correct that. Any, you know, people accept most of what we believe we don't really have proofs for that we just accept because einstein said so newton said so like how many people have actually gone out to confirm for themselves that uh, a thing drops from the sky uh, and the rate of uh, that drop is proportional to the weight or the mass not the weight the mass of the object coming down. Joyce has this, uh, I don't know why I'm recalling Joyce here, but this line of 32 per second per second, this rate of uh, the, the force with which the gravity pulls. So most of the things we believe in, we don't really have confirmed them, but we believe them. So the answer again is uh, this dua to the, for the heart to be cleansed and uh, this veil that has come can go away. But we should return to our ayah, inshallah. And if there is a case, real case of someone, uh, you know, these are family issues, but there are ways in our tradition we have every answer we need to have. So the ayah says, La lakum tattakun. Ya yu nasu udu rabbakum ulazi khalakakum ulazina min kablikum la lakum tattakun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is providing us not a rationale but at least uh, a consequence of uh, ibadah of worshipping him let's try to understand this la'allakum the takun, we have done this before, we'll do it again, taqwa. La'allakum is untranslatable because this is a fluid situation of hope and fear. Allah SWT says, La'allahu yatazakkaru aw yaksha. This is when uh, he sends Musa al-Islam to Fir'aun. Perhaps the sa'a is near. So 
So, Na'alla uh, is translated, perhaps you will have taqwa. It's translated as, so that you may have taqwa. Meaning that this is not, the construction is such that it does not really give us confirm, confirmation that if we worship, then we will have taqwa. It says, la'allakum. Perhaps, maybe. Why is that? And in this case of uh, Fir'aun, Musa alayhi salam, when they are sent, Musa and Harun, Harun both of them, la'allahu yatazakkaru au yaksha. Go and uh, invite him, perhaps, la'allahu, Maybe he will have yaksha. He will have khash. He he would have. A, he would accept, or he would be afraid. Perhaps is not the right translation because. But why is this used? Uh, so Razi Sahab again, and he, mashallah, he you know he does all the thinking for us. So he first asks questions, then he answers questions. So he says, why why would La Allah be here instead of saying for sure you will have taqwa if you worship me? He says that when the kings, when they when they promise something, all they do is they just smile, or they just hint at something that this will happen. And that's all they need to do. They don't need to write it down for you. People just people just know when they make the request and the king smiles, or he just indicates through some other subtle means that, uh, yes, I accept you. So that's... Uh, The second, uh, not in this place, actually, is first the Lili. The first reason is that this is La Allah is in respect to the human being, not in respect to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. La Allah is here. Uh, La is from the perspective of those who will worship. Maybe they would have uh, taqwa, and it depends on their worship. The khalus, the ikhlas, the sincerity of their worship. That's why this is La Allah. So second is this. The third uh, is that uh, um, this La Allah is actually in the meaning of Kai, so that. And you would find some translations which would use this Kai, La Allah, uh, in the meaning of Kai, so that. And uh, he actually quotes uh, the Makshari who said, no, no, this is not the case. But La Allah is to, to give, <laughs> give some chocolate to someone. <laughs> he says, this is uh, the Makshari saying that this is just, Allah SWT is providing hope. And uh, when the Kareem and Rahim gives hope, that is a substitute for a prom promise. And that is the meaning of La Allah uh, in, in the meaning of Kai, so that. So this is a promise, but this promise is through this uh, sweetener, La Allah. The fourth uh, la Allah, fourth uh, use, uh, reason for using this is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave all those who are mukallifin, who are accountable to him, guidance to good and evil. He gives them aql, intellect, 
And therefore, he closed their cases. He gave them all the resources. He gave them all the inner abilities to act. And then the only thing left is this la Allah, that they will for sure receive the reward if they use the means given to them and if they use the guidance that is given to them, that will be consequential. That will be the reason that for achieving taqwa. Otherwise, there will be no need or there will be no uh, value in these resources and this guidance. So this guidance for sure will lead, lead to taqwa, whosoever acts upon it. The fifth reason is, uh, and again he is quoting, first he quoted uh, the Makshari, and this is from uh, Sheikh Kafal. He says, uh, La Allah, he says, is actually a repetition because the Arabs, uh, they say, La Allah, Baad, and Nahlan. And this uh, La, the first La, is actually Lam Taqeed. Lam Lakad. So La Allah is actually Allah. Ain Lam, and there's a Shad. Allaka Antaf Al Kaza. La Allah is therefore an addition to Allah, which uh, means that. Uh, this action that you would do, this worship that you would do, it will reinforce your uh, your desire to be the slave of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this uh, this means that this is intensifying, reinforcing the relationship between the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and of attainment of taqwa. So what is being said that uh, worship Worship and taqwa are related to each other. More you worship, more taqwa you will get. However, this should not be confused that worship and taqwa are the same thing, he says. Because, and now we can deepen our understanding of taqwa as well, because ittaka is protection from harm. And the ibadah, the command to worship, is an action that needs, that is being demanded. And that action is not equivalent to the means of to, through the protection, what one does for protecting oneself. But it is the cause. So what is being said is that worship your Rabb so that you protect yourself from the punishment. Because there is reward and there is punishment, whether one accepts it or not, believes in it or not. Because there is nothing neutral. I mean, we only have two places to go to when we die. Fama khalaqtul jinna wal insa illa liya'budun. And I have not created the jinn and the ins except to worship me. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that. Subhanallah.
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the ability to worship him, especially in these last days and nights of this blessed month. May he protect us. May he open, his, open our hearts. We are inshallah going to continue uh, with the next ayah which would be ayah number 22nd. Allazee ja'ala lakum ul ardha firasha wa sama binaam wa anzala min as sama iman fa akhraja bihi min as samarat rizqan lakum wa la taj'alu lillahi andadan wa antum ta'lamun But before we do that next uh, week, I'm hoping we can at least begin this 22nd ayah, but I want to have a session on ibadah as I said before. Um, what is what is ibadah? I mean, we know we have been commanded to pray five times a day, fast the month of Ramadan, go for Hajj, pay zakat. But what are all of these are obviously items and aspects of worshiping of ibadah, but. Is this the only thing? I was actually prompted to say something about this because of certain messages which came about when the Ramadan started. So the, the question of Ibadah, what is Ibadah? We'll begin our session. What is Ibadah? I think that would be helpful in deepening our understanding of our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Are there any questions? Inshallah, if we could just let our great Razi do the thinking for us and keep asking questions, that's helpful. رَبَّنَا آتِنَا فِي الدُّنِيَا حَسَنَا وَفِي الْآخِرَاتِ حَسَنَا وَقِنَا عَذَابَ النَّارِ يَا كَرِيمٌ يَا اللَّهَ أَنْتَ حَلِيمٌ كَرِيمٌ عَظِيمٌ تُحِبُ الْعَفْوَ فَعْفُ النَّا يَا كَرِيمٌ اللَّهُمَ افْتَحْ لَنَا بُعَبِ رَحْمَتِكِ يَا رَبِّ الْعَلَمِينَ رَبَّنَا ظَلَمْنَا أَنفُسَنَا وَإِن لَّمْ تَغْفِرْ لَنَا وَتَرْحَمْنَا لَنَكُونَنَّ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ يَا كَرِيمٌ اللہ منصر اخواننا فی الفلسطین فی الغزہ و فی کل مکان یا رب العالمین یا شافی اشفی صدورنا و بطوننا من کل دا یا کریم رب اخفر برخم انتا خیر الراحمین اللہم صلی علی سیدنا محمد و علیہ و صحابہ اجمعین السلام علیکم و رحمت اللہ و برکاتہ